Hey guys, Trevor Boone from Emerald City Guitars. I'm holding not only one of my favorite guitars to come to the shop, but one of my favorite guitar stories. So it's a 1951 one owner Fender Nocaster. To quickly reiterate the history of these guitars, the Broadcaster came out in 1950. It was the first mass produced guitar that Fender made, electric guitar that Fender made. I made a couple hundred of those. So at the same time, Gretsch had a drum kit called the Broadcaster. Fender ended up having to take the Broadcaster logo off the headstock, so there were roughly 475 to 500 models that came out with no Broadcaster decal, known as the Nocaster. Later in 51, they settled on the name the Telecaster. Not only are these extremely desirable by Fender collectors or vintage guitar collectors, they're incredible instruments. Falls in the Blackguard Telecaster category, Broadcasters, Nocasters, early Telecasters. So that's a little history on the Nocaster itself. This is a one owner example. Let me get into that whole background. You might have seen some videos in the past with our friend Chris Jansen. He lives in Washington. His great grandfather was Leo Fender's first salesman. First by train, then eventually a Cadillac with a matching Cadillac trailer. He delivered all Fender products up the West Coast, um, I think as far as Montana. Pretty amazing history. We've done videos with him. He has Leo Fender's original bench amp and just like, you know, he's such a historian, amazing guy, and he's really family to the shop. So he was down here hanging one day. We get a knock on the door and we have a camera out there and I see a guy with a thermometer case. So Chris and I kind of see him go, okay, well, what's that? Unannounced completely. The guy walks in with his father's 1951 Nocaster. It's also a Washington native guitar. So Chris Jansen, our buddy here, his great grandfather would drop this guitar off in 1951. You know, I'm standing there like, this is a dream acquisition. I want this guitar so bad. This is what shops dream of. But it was one of those moments that I decided to step back and just let Chris and this guy work it out. It was like, Chris, you need this guitar. And Chris isn't a massive guitar player by any means, but he's a historian and an amazing caretaker. So Chris ended up working it out with this guy. There's a great video on our On The Road series called 1951 Nocaster, Finding Its Way Home or something like that. But check it out. It's actually the whole process about how we helped Chris get this, which was really fun. He traded in a lot of guitars. We sold a bunch for him raised the capital and was able to get this guitar. So it's been a few years and Chris understands that sometimes you gotta let these things go so the story continues. Ladies and gentlemen, right now, Johnny Johnson and Country Reunion. The original owner's son sent us this amazing video, Johnny Johnson and the Country Reunion, where you can see and hear this Nocaster being played on this old school, you know, local television show. And it was just like, that's the kind of stuff that we live for. That's what it's about. Just an extraordinary guitar in every, every aspect. Really, really light example. All original except the pots were switched out in 1982. The original bridge cover, original case, and it has one of the original broadcaster straps that are so rare and kind of funny because they're very, very short, you know, so people would be holding the guitar way up high, which kind of ties into the special feature I'm gonna let Tyler tell you about. All right, so Tyler back here with this amazing 1951 Fender Nocaster. Now, not only does this guitar have excellent weight, a really, really great vibey wear, and probably the most amazing bridge pickup I've ever heard, but it also has one sort of mysterious feature that has confused and intrigued pretty much everyone we've shown it to, and that is this quarter inch hole that has been drilled on the base side of the body here. Holes drilled in vintage guitars are not a new thing. We see them all the time. They're most often the artifact of some unfortunate aftermarket modification, but we have pretty good reason to believe that this particular hole was drilled at the factory, and I'll show you why. So firstly, when you're using a hand drill or even a drill press to drill a hole in wood or really anything, it's vitally important that the drill bit is completely perpendicular to your work surface. If it's not, if it's canted out like this, the drill bit's gonna slip, it's gonna wanna run downhill, and create a very uneven, chippy, kind of oblong hole. It's not a precise way to do things at all. And when we look at this particular hole, we can see that it's very clean, completely round, and very, very neat. Now that means one of two things. Either this hole had to be drilled before the body was cut out, when it was just a blank and it was flat across here, or it could have been cut on an angle like this, but it requires a very, very precise, huge industrial machine, something like an industrial milling machine, and a very, very short, stiff bit. Now, it's pretty unlikely that a musician in the early 1950s would have ready access to something like that. So the second thing that's really remarkable about the precision of this hole uh, can be seen where it terminates. It's under the guard right here in this diagonal wire route. Now, the edge of the hole is exactly, exactly in line 
with the bottom of that cavity. Now firstly, it requires an extremely precise and complicated sort of setup to even get the right location on the outside for drilling that hole. Um, it would have to be kind of slanted like this. You'd have to shim everything up and have a really, really precise setup. Now the second thing is, in order to drill a hole of this length, you need something called an aircraft bit. These are very long drill bits. And even though a quarter inch is a pretty big bit, you can see there's quite a bit of flex along the length of this entire drill bit. Now, when we're drilling holes this long, we know wood isn't a regular sort of uh, material. There's soft spots and hard spots and tougher grain and knots even in some cases. Now what that causes in holes this long is that the tip of the drill bit, the longer the hole goes, it'll wanna wander a little bit uh, avoid the harder stuff and kind of find the path of least resistance. Now this sort of wandering of the drill bit makes it really, really difficult to have a precise ending to a hole this long. Uh, and so that's just one more thing that makes it really remarkable that they're able to pull this off. Now with all my tools in the shop, I could set up this cut. It'd, it'd take all morning to set up this cut. I could do it 10 times and it wouldn't turn out as nice as this one is. It's just amazing. So the third and final piece of evidence we have supporting the fact that this was a factory hole, it's probably the most compelling, and that's that there is original buffing compound and original finish that can be seen on the insides on either end of these holes. So this white buffing compound that Fender used, we often see it around the edges of pickup cavities, control cavities, around the neck pockets sometimes. That same compound can very clearly be seen from the outside right here. And then on this side where it terminates in the route, uh, we can see a very clear, a very original mist of finish uh, on the inside of the hole that matches perfectly that of the bottom of the cavities. Obviously, this would not be present if the hole had been drilled after the finishing process. So we do not know what the purpose of this hole was at all. We have showed this thing to the world's craziest fender freaks, historians, everybody, and nobody has any sort of idea what it is. So we've theorized that maybe this was a hole for a microphone that would come up right to your face. Um, you can run the wires down through. Also, maybe like a harmonica holder, uh, just because of its location and angle. So we don't know what it's for. No one we've talked to knows the purpose of it, but we are sure that it's just a cool mystery that adds even more allure to an already awesome instrument. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Skylar Mihal, who's here. He's gonna show you how it sounds.